church. Good evening. I'm so happy to be here. I love to be in church with the believers. I hope you're glad to be here too. Amen. All right. Let the joy of the Lord fill this place.
because Jesus humbled himself to the point of death, God the Father exalted him and gave him a name that is above every other name. Amen. That's the name we call upon. That's the name we run to. That's the name that moves mountains. That's the name that comforts us. Amen. Let's sing it one more time. Worthy is the Lamb. Bless your word in our hearts. Amen. Um, good evening, everyone. Good to be here. Um, I love it when you get a text message when you're in the harbor tunnel, <laughs> coming from work, and it's 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 so awesome to be here. That was the place I was planning to come to tonight. Was this church? Um, it's so good to be with you guys, and to be in God's presence. Um, as a word of introduction, I want to give you guys. Uh, uh, a word that would just relate to why we're here, and that the that word is joy. Um, and maybe tonight, joy is not something we would describe uh, our situation, our state. But I had something really good to share because we have Bibles, right? We got Bibles. It's amazing, Bibles, and they have words and words that change and heal. Um, Lord, thank you so much for your words. They're forever true. And in heaven, you have words for us. We thank you so much for your, your son, Jesus, for he is joy. He is joy expressed to us in our hearts. We ask that you would bless these words to your, your name and to your glory. Amen. Is it me or is this microphone like super, like hot? Like it's, I feel like I'm whispering, and if I were to yell, I would scare you guys. Okay, um, turn in your Bibles to Second Chronicles 29, and I just want to comment on a couple of verses because joy is something that um, joy is different than happiness. Okay, right? We know that. Um, why do we know that? Because we're born again. Being born again uh, helps us understand what is eternal. And I really believe joy is something that is eternal. It is a straight line. It is, it's like agape love. It is one of the virtues that has been poured out through the Holy Spirit to us. And because in Ephesians 1.13 we're sealed with the Spirit, we have joy, okay? That's the baseline. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, our foundation and our cornerstone is Jesus Christ. So put that in the bag. We got it, okay? So just that's, that's what we have. Now, when joy comes into our life as believers um, through Jesus and through the Holy Spirit and through the Word of God and through the body of Christ, um, Many things can happen. 
as the days and weeks and years go by. You know, we're all getting older after all. But the, the good news is, is joy stays constant because it is the Holy Spirit. It is not happiness. Happiness is temporal. Happiness has a partial limit. And that's why actually the devil has a short time. He has no joy and nor, neither does this world. It's partial. It is set in stone and he knows it. And so does this world and actually so does our flesh. But joy through the Holy Spirit, through the word of God, is a consistent straight line that never changes. Now, here's the thing that I was thinking about as a word of encouragement to us, is that sometimes joy, and I want to give this illustration, that uh, joy gets buried. If joy, the most precious thing in your house, I don't know, for a woman, maybe it's China or like, you know, like a... <laughs> Or like, or, or no, just like a, like a thing, like a, a, maybe for a guy, a young guy, it's like a medal or a um, uh, MVP, like it's a trophy that he has on his, on his desk or on his shelf. It's the most valuable thing. And it, when he looks at it, he sees so much joy, so much happiness. Now, Jesus being that person in us, sometimes gets buried. Have you ever grown up and gone back to the, to the boxes of where your mom collected your stuff and you were like, oh, there's my trophy and I pulled it out. And it, it meant so much to me then, but it kind of got buried in all the other stuff of my life. Um, but this was one of the most meaningful things in my life, getting this MVP from coach or something, you know. <laughs> but this, that, that got buried. And actually... In America, I have seen that this happens to a lot of us in our culture. And that happens through the things that we attain, the things that we let into our heart even, the things that we purchase and, and gather and, and I would dare say hoard to a place where joy gets covered up. Now in 2 Chronicles 29, a man of God named Hezekiah it says in verse 3 of 2 Chronicles 29, it says that he, in the first year of his new life, or, well, new reign as king, he was going to clean up the temple of the Lord. And it says in verse 3, that in the first year of his reign, in the first month, he opened the doors of the, of the house of the Lord and repaired them. And he brought in the priests and the Levites and assembled them in the square of the east. And he said to them, hear me, Levites. Now consecrate yourselves and consecrate the house of the Lord, the God of our fathers, and carry out all the filth from the holy place. Now because of time, if we were to read this chapter, I want to point out a couple of things. Hezekiah saw that the place that brought Israel and the people of God great joy was the house of the Lord. It was the center. It was what he had done for them. He had delivered us and, and them and us out of our Egypts. And when Hezekiah saw this, he commanded them to do this the very first month of his reign. And it goes on to say that he goes to, to um, in verse 15, he tells, he tells the priest to take these basically take the garbage, and in verse 16, they carry it out to the brook Kidron. They go and take out all the trash, and they just throw it in the river. And, and it's such a beautiful picture of, like, they found something so precious, so valuable, the most precious, the only eternal thing, and they gathered it, and they carried it out just as the king said. Now, in the end of the verse, I mean, end of the chapter, towards the end, in verse uh, 28, it says, the whole assembly worshipped. They came together and worshipped. Now, Hezekiah asked them to, like, come together and do what he said to honor God and remember him. And so they did that. And, um, and then at the very last verse of the chapter, in chapter 29, it says that Hezekiah and all the people rejoiced because God had provided for the people, for the thing came about suddenly. 
And I love this, this phrase that it came about suddenly. That joy is like it's going to be, it's going to be that way when Jesus comes back. It's going to happen suddenly. That's how someone gets saved. It doesn't take hours and days and weeks. The moment someone puts their trust in God, they are translated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. It happens suddenly. Uh, when, when the devil will be thrown into the, to the fiery pit, it will happen suddenly. When Jesus comes back and he rides on that white horse and he carries and he says those names and he carries that sword, it will happen suddenly. And I was thinking that, like, if joy is this way, it's, like, right around the corner. It's not something that we have to, like, uh, check off a lot of boxes, maybe do this and perform, but actually the Holy Spirit is waiting and willing. And if we were to just brush apart our flesh and brush apart the things that can clutter this amazing, precious thing, thing uh, that is Christ in us, things happen suddenly. And in the last part of this, the next chapter, Hezekiah goes and says, which is such, he's such a great missionary in this picture. He goes, go tell all the other brothers of Israel. And in half the chapter through, some people laugh, some people scorn, some people mock. But then it says in verse 11 of chapter 30, um, that Zebulon humbled themselves. Asher, Manasseh, and Zebulon humbled themselves. And they came to Jerusalem. Hezekiah wanted to bring all the people back to the house of the Lord, the place where they cleaned up the holy temple and they wanted to honor God. And it says at the end of the chapter, of chapter 30, it says in verse 26, And this is after the people come just as they are. All the people come back to Jerusalem. And they all come back. And it says in in 2 Chronicles 30, verse 26, it says, So there was great joy in Jerusalem. For since the time of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, there had been nothing like this in Jerusalem. It happens suddenly, and there's nothing quite like it. Like, I want to... Like, God, help me, bring me back to when I first believed. Like, bring me back to when I first got saved. Can you do that? Absolutely. I was thinking, like, how, how can this joy be kept? You know, like, maybe, you know, the Holy Spirit is sealed in our heart, never to leave us. So if joy is there, it's a, just a matter of not holding on to it but brushing aside and keeping the things that clutter it, that cover it, that would bury and disguise and shroud the beauty that is Christ. That in moments like these, when we just focus on Christ, like in a Wednesday night, after work, after, after school, after all the things, we get that fresh feeling and understanding and revelation of what joy is. And so... Joy, joy is, is so, um, I think for us as Christians, it's the one thing that we can testify to the world that doesn't need words. It doesn't need words. It's just a life. It's a straight line. Everything else has to be written down and drawn and described in this world. But that wasn't Jesus. You know, he wasn't this flashy person. He was joy. He was of no comeliness, no guile. He just was him. He was Christ. And so I think when, when we think about joy and we think about this church and what the Lord does through us, let us not shroud or let the things of this world cover up what is in my heart, what God has given us, like, as a church, as a ministry, to go into all the world, to, to love the people in our neighborhood. Like, it's amazing what we're doing. And I think about this, when the shrouding happens, I can, I can lose the sense of joy. But as a Christian, joy is always there. You, you, it's just a matter of just unearthing it and just taking out some of the things that maybe are in our life. 
that have kept us from seeing that beautiful light, that beautiful voice, those beautiful eyes of Jesus, those beautiful hands and feet, right? We think about all the things that make that joy come alive. That joy comes alive through people and through our book and through, through many of the things that we see here today. So tonight as a church, I encourage you to think about joy as something both we have and that's something that we don't have to keep it, but actually we have to just keep it at the center. Like we hold it at the center and let nothing cover it. Let nothing come over it. Let it be held up high. Amen. That was beautiful, wasn't it? Just keeping joy, maintaining joy, protecting joy that we have, right? We don't have to, um, we don't have to produce joy. We have joy, yeah. but we want to protect it. I love that. Um, just a few announcements before I start, though. Do we have any first-time visitors, anyone here that's visiting us for the, the very first time? Just if you don't mind raising your hand, we just want to um, give you a welcome packet introduce ourselves to you, and then just ask if you, if you want to introduce yourself to us. Anybody here? Okay, if you're shy, uh, you can go see the Welcome Center after service, and they'll give you that welcome packet. Um, and also, Welcome Sunday, if you are new or, or uh, you've been coming to the church for um, a few weeks, a few months, and you want to get to know us, we have our Welcome Sunday happening. That is going to be Sunday, April 28th, uh, after the morning service. I believe, will be with a welcome Sunday. Um, Jermaine Andreas face-to-face -face memorial service is going to be uh, this Sunday at 1 p.m. in the GGCA chapel. Okay, so Jermaine Andreas face-to-face -face will be Sunday 1 p.m. in the GGCA chapel. Also, register now for the NBCNS banquet that's coming up. Bible College is slowly coming to uh, an end for the spring semester. And uh, that culminates in graduation and then MBCNS banquet. So um, that you can register at at the mbcs.edu website. Uh, on May 24th, that will be at 6 p.m. So that, that happens on May 24th, Friday, May 24th, 6 p.m. Alumni, alums, get a discount of 15%. Okay, if you like more info with that, you can either call the MBCS office or you can uh, go to the website and there, there should be some information on there. Um, and last but not least, uh, who here likes trees? Looking at them, seeing what's in them, listening to the sounds they produce. I personally love them. Christmas trees, not Christmas trees. We are giving away free trees. And I shouldn't say we, I, I think there's an organization that's behind it. But um, there's free native trees. This happened last year. So you're, this is your chance if you missed it last year. You can, you can come and get some uh, free native trees. These are like legit trees. I'm not talking like small little dinky trees. These are serious trees, so make sure you have the room in your yard, you know, scope out where you want to put it, like really do some research. Um, and if you'd like information on this, you can see the Welcome Center about the types of trees, because it's not just one tree. Like I said, these are some real trees, different colors, giant, smaller, but still pretty big trees, okay? Um, and now if I wouldn't, um, if you would welcome uh, Pastor Hadley for... Oh, the offering. But I've wronged Pastor Hadley, Mike. <laughs> I was looking over at Pastor. All right, how you doing? Everybody have joy? Thumbs up? We got all the thumbs up? Okay. Is my brother here? Could he come up for just a sec? Uh, John, Brother John. So I'm sure you guys have, you know that we're brothers, right? You've connected the dots. Some people are still trying to figure us out. But... Oh, brother. <laughs> so, uh, so this is my great brother, John, and um, just had a question for him. John, how long have you been in the church here F from way back, the beginning? 40, 
Wait, 76. 76. 48? Wow. 48 years? Mm -hmm. huh. And I'm, I think I'm like 35 years. Yeah, I'm a baby. So, <laughs> so um, but I was ju just thinking, since you're in the church, do you, would you say that your life has been big or has your life been, no, let's reverse that. Has your life been little or has your life been big being here in the church? What do you think? Big. Yeah, yes. You know what we do? We teach our Bible kids that you, your life can either be, all right, make pretend you're the kids now. We do this all the time. You, your life can be small like this, right? Or it can be big like this. Like this. And being in this church has been th probably the main reason why we have had such great lives, wouldn't you say? And we Absolutely. have joy. Yes. So, so for the offering, I just thought, what a reason to give. Uh, just one more question. Look, look at these folks. Aren't they amazing? Well, look at, me, look at. Let me, let me look. Let me look. look at. <laughs> I mean, really. Yeah, they, pretty much, yeah. They are yeah, ama absolutely. amazing. <laughs> amazing. Are you guys amazing? I'm not trying to, you know, I'm not trying to get you to give more. I mean, that would be good, but, but we're telling you the truth. All we know, a lot of you personally, and may, maybe some of you folks we don't know, but we have a great body here. We have something very, very special here, don't we? So we just want to keep it. I mean, God's going to keep it going, but let's, you know, do the best we can give, okay? So this is going to be a 50-50 prayer. I'll start, you finish. Okay. All right. So, Lord, I just pray that you would touch all our hearts of our beautiful body here in Baltimore. And even online, we pray uh, to give. And? And, Lord, I pray you would answer my brother Jim's prayer. <laughs> Amen. Amen.
following that song with the uh, Song of Solomon by chance. Yeah? Nobody? Okay. Uh, song of Solomon. You want to put that on the screen just for a second just because the words were precious and beautiful that portion where if I were a wall. Chapter 8 Song of Solomon 8 and verse... Uh, Nine, if she be a wall, we'll build upon her a palace of silver. If she be a door, verse 10, I am a wall. Beautiful. Thank you so much for that song and the ministry of the Spirit here tonight. Boy, Pastor Roger, thank you for the word on on joy. Wasn't that good? Uh, what my takeaway from his word was the temple needed to be cleaned out, the inner part, and once it got cleared out and they threw it away, they got rid of the, the filth, then the spirit came and there was joy and singing and revival. Sometimes in our lives, I got to get all the, the garbage out. And then the, the light comes, the encouragement comes. Uh, what do you do? I, I have a couple of thoughts here, but this won't be long. But what do you do when, when a person is so depressed that they lose motivation? They're not motivated, They've, they're depressed. So there's a darkness with a Christian. And the depression is heavy on their soul, and they can't listen, they can't really pray, they're so discouraged. I, we are counselors, and we, we help people, and we, we study it, we think about it, and we really want, want to help people find the spiritual life, what Roger said, Pastor Roger, was so well. Like, the joy is ours. Why can't I find that? Or uh, Jesus is real, and how is it I don't really know that that well? Just a couple points about it. Um, one side point is uh, I, I talk to people, and they come here, and they, 
they say, yeah, when I, when I come in, I leave, I end up leaving my, my stuff at the door. And I just find myself entering into worship. And I just say, but, you know, I'm, I'm so glad I came. I came uh, almost, I didn't come, but I came, and I'm actually surprised at how I feel about being here and the joy, uh, the life, the love, just to see people worshiping God like we do and how good that is and for the Spirit to minister to us. Uh, so there's a lot of things to say about this depressed person, but I want you to see number, number one is it happens. It happens to people. Um, you, you, if you, if it happens to some, if it happens to you, uh, just realize there is a way out, and be very patient, and realize the darkness can go, and the heaviness, and the lack of motivation, uh, the lack of interest, the lack of engagement. People get real numb. They get real numb and they get real tired and they get they check out. They can sleep all day. Uh, they they just are discreet. They can hardly get a positive thought uh, out of their hearts and in their minds, and they feel very guilty about it. Uh, but it can change. It can change, but it takes effort. But a certain kind, not not in the flesh, but a certain kind of surrender and of trust, and, stay, and, and just realizing, and that's all that I want to say about it, I think, is that uh, uh, don't give up. Amen. Don't give up. Wait, wait upon God and become a listener, and the Lord will minister to you, because he is that way. He is the minister. He is the Savior. He is the high priest. He is the one that cares about you. And your light can come come right out of the morning. I mean, your light can break like the like right out of the it, the light. He get Luke one seventy eight. He gives light to those that sit in darkness. I mean, it, it's amazing what can happen because he is the well, the light of the world. He is the way, the truth, the life. Now, the problems that we can ingest and the problems that we can have, that we can carry around, can wear us down. And, uh, and you, you're not made to be ground down. You are not. You are made to be lighthearted. Uh, you, you know, this is re- really to be ministered to. You are made to be like a child. To be child, light, light-hearted like a child. You're made to uh, be bouncing around, having a good time in life. Am I saying, wow. Yeah, no, you and I are made to have a good time in this life. And, and Pastor Roger is saying about joy and how, how that is a very real thing, a, a steady line. So um, let's now go to the message and this is from the book of Esther <clears throat> and I'm kind of you know um, this is the way that this message uh, I had one two three things here but it'll be another message so just to, that's a little bit of a teaser maybe I don't mean it in a bad way but just there's much to say about it but this is, this is relating, but it's not that. So Esther. Uh, let me get my watch ready, because I don't want to keep you. Here it goes. Lord Jesus, minister, thank you so much for that song, so much for the offering. Thank you so much for what Pastor Jim said and Pastor John, for the the... Just so much, we just thank you, Lord, and use these thoughts to help us understand. In Jesus' name, Amen. When in the high school today, I taught a, a lesson with the 
students, and one of the students said, could you tell us about the book of Esther? And so I called her over to me, and, we, and I just took time, and I let the, other, the others do their things. But I talked to that student, and as I was speaking, I, I realized this is such a beautiful story, and I, I feel like maybe I should share it tonight. And it's very simple. We, we read, the, read the book of Esther. It's ten chapters. And, um, and you can read it and pull things out of it and understand it. There was a preacher that visited us many years ago, Ian Thomas, who wrote a book about it. Pastor Steve has also taught about it this way. And the, these are... These are just types and provoking us to think about the book and what it means. So uh, bear with me when we come to types and metaphors and bear with me. I'm not, I don't want to spend a lot of time and read a lot of verses. I just want to paraphrase it and put package it real simple and draw some conclusions about it. Okay. First of all, it's a big country, I'll draw it this way, from India to Ethiopia, 127 provinces or states, multilingual nation or empire, a lot of people. The Jews are scattered around in the, in the territory, probably mostly living in the Babylonian section. The Persians defeated the Babylonians, and the, the king Ahasuerus, became the king of the territory. So I'll draw his picture like this. I'll put a, a, a crown on him like this. He's a king. Not a good crown, but it's okay. Uh, he has a wife, Vashti, and he also has a big party. The party lasted 180 days, and the decorations and the hangings, it would have made Scotty Dubay envious <laughs> how decorated the meeting halls, the marble, all the polished furnishings, the hanging linens and velvets and colors and who has a beautiful huge feast and festival like a world fair and he called his princes and the governors and everyone to the party and he was they were celebrating, eating and drinking and so on. And then um, he has a problem with his wife, Vashti. And he, he wants her to come to present herself because she's very beautiful. But she refuses to do it. This becomes a crisis in his government because she is disobeying her husband, disobeying the king. And so he has... A major problem. In the story, as it unfolds, you see different elements. One is that one, that he can't solve a relationship problem with his wife. He decides to get rid of her. They actually counsel him, get rid of her. And that's one way that you can solve your problems. You can get rid of people. And this would, this would be a picture of, if you and make an analogy of, 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 of the way people are, you could say the soul of man without Christ is like this. The soul of man can govern, but he can't minister. The soul of man can have authority and run gas stations and companies and countries, but he can't solve the most important problems that he has in life. He can't solve relationship problems. He can't minister. And if you think about Christ, Christ is this way, that he's the Christ of the universe, and the thing about him is that he loves us, and that he, in our situations, cares about us. He touches us. He ministers to us. He doesn't throw us away. He saves us. He sent the Spirit into, the, into our world so that we could know God. 
But this king doesn't really have God in the, in the sense. Actually, interesting thing, the word God is not mentioned one time in the book of Esther. And therefore, the rabbis had a big question if it should be in their canon of Scripture. But they made a great decision because it's all about God and the Jewish people. Okay. This man goes to his counselors, and they say, you can't have her as a wife. She's disqualified because she didn't do what you asked. Oh, you don't do what I, what I ask you to do, and so you're cut off. Yes. That's the way the world is. That's the way we are without God in our life. Because when God is in your life, you realize he doesn't cut you off. He loves you. He serves you, washes your feet, prays for you, intercedes for you, talks to you, ministers to you, heals you, gives you grace, cares about us, visits us in the morning, helps us out, loves us more than anything in the whole universe. He loves us. We are the objects of his love. He is God. So in the story, there's a guy that comes into the picture that comes a little, so I'll go chronologically. In the story, he gets another wife. So let's put it this way. Um, she has a little crown. She becomes the queen. And she is the new queen, and her name is Esther. What does she represent in the story? What, what, who is she? She's feminine. She's a woman who is praying, who is caring, who has been chosen, who he fell in love with who he realized, like this woman, that's the woman, that she was beautiful, very attractive to him, and he took her as his wife. He doesn't realize it, but she's very important to him as the king because she's able to give counsel. She's able to help him. She's able to like be part of it, be part of what he needs because, in a sense, Left alone, King Ahasuerus is prone to mess up things, just like you and me. That's a good point. I am prone to mess up things. I am prone to break up relationships that should be valuable to me. I am prone to make a bad decision. I am prone to have a guy come into my government who's actually an evil man. And that is what happened in the story. An evil man comes in, snidely whiplash, with a big mustache. He comes into the picture, and he becomes the counselor for the king. And by the way, I think you realize this, that if a demon had a choice of being in control of a drug addict in the streets of Baltimore, or if the demon had a choice to be in charge of a leader, a general, a king, a president, a prime minister, the head of an organization, what would the demon, what, if you were a demon, who would you like to be, who would you like to be communicating with? Right. Who would you like to influence? The higher up, the more honor that is for me, more destructive I can be. How much I can lie, how much I can deceive, how much I can mislead people. If I could be the head of a television company or a social platform company, if I could be in charge of a country or a publishing house or a Hollywood movie industry, if I could be in there and I could choose what is going on and I can affect millions of people, where, where would the demon want to be? Next to the boss. And they gravitate to the bosses. And there was a guy that did that in this case. And his name was Haman. And Haman counseled the king this way. He said, King, there's a people in your empire. They are not a good people for you. 
We need to get rid of them. Their laws are different. They are different. And we need to destroy them. And we can pick a certain day and on that day turn people against them and genocide and get rid of all the Jews in the whole empire of 127 provinces. And guess what the king said? Okay, let's do it. And Haman said, I will pay for it. I will pay for it out of my own money. And it's millions and millions. I think it might even be billions of dollars. I did the number, but we won't, I won't. I'm just provoking you to do it yourself. It's there, 10,000 talents. A talent is 75 pounds of silver. Like what was the value of 75 pounds of silver it's times 10,000. It's a huge number. Where Haman got that money, I don't know, but he gave it to the treasury so that this thing would be paid for. And the king signed it, and that was good. Here's the lesson. If you and I are sleeping, if we are soulish, our soul will get attached to things and we'll be blind to what is really important. We might become part of some evil thing without realizing it. If we are sleeping, and I mean spiritually, if we are indifferent, if we are more occupied with our vacation than we are occupied with God's heart, vacations are fine, but what's God's heart? Matt, you know how it is. I don't know how, what, what can we say? I'm more occupied with my garden. I got to have a garden. I have a garden. I have a little fish pond. You should come and see it sometime. I have a little fish pond. And uh, I have a little garden. You can have all that. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying a soulish man doesn't know how to control his appetites. He doesn't know what's important. He doesn't know when evil is sitting on the couch next to him. He doesn't know when evil is being propagated in our culture and we are not recognizing what is really happening until Esther shows up. Now, in your life, Esther came. Christ came into your life. She's related to the guy over here whose name is Mordecai. He's the hero in the story. And he is a picture, a type of Christ. Christ is not bowing to Haman. Christ wakes us up. Christ sends Esther to the king. And Esther is saying, like, there's something about us in our free will. There's something about us to protect ourselves. I can't go to the king. I, I can't, I, I don't have the permission. I don't, if I, it's not done right, I could get killed. And Marty Kai is saying, do you think you're going to escape this thing? <laughs> you think you're, you're a Jew. And, I, and I'm, I'm the brother of your dad, and your dad passed, but I'm in charge. And I'm telling you that you're not going to escape. If this plan goes on, you're going to die too. And so she said, give me three days for prayer and fasting and have, tell people to pray and fast. Now make my decision. And she said, I'm going. I'm going. What a big decision. I'm going for it, and if I perish, I perish. Now, that spirit is in you. That's the spirit of God that is in us. And there's something about that that shows up like in our mission work where you might say, no, we got a lot of reason to stay home. But then there are people that say, I'm going in. I want to go. There's something in my heart. I want to go. We can go. We can do this. It's, it's like a joy, isn't it? Or why don't you say it this way? Why don't we say, listen, I know you got a problem with your wife, Vashti, but you have the Spirit of God. Why don't you have a talk with her? And you know, you know what she might have said? He, he could just sit with her and goes, now, this is difficult because you disobeyed, but I need to know why. What's the problem? I didn't want to show off in front of people. Or I felt you're using me as a, as a tool. Or I felt abused. Or I felt that it wasn't right. I don't know why. I had a stomach ache that day. I don't know what the... I, don't, I mean, just talk. 
Just talk, can you be honest to, with somebody that cares about you? Right? Not power play, but right? somebody that loves you. That's how Jesus opens our hearts, that he cares about us. And if the king cared about his wife, but he couldn't do it because he didn't have the Spirit of God. But you have the Spirit of God. You and I care about our country. You and I care about what's happening. We're not checking out. We're not like falling asleep and say, there's no problem here. There's evil at the door. And, and they already made the decision way down the road, far away from where you think. You think everything's fine. It is not. There's already the day planned for the genocide to happen with the Jewish people. And, and Hezekiah says, what? I think of a person waking up like, what? What happened? Yeah, on your watch, king, there's a genocide that's going to happen in the 12th month and the 13th day, and you signed the order. And that's what Esther, in effect, said to him. And he woke up, and he just real, he didn't even know what was happening. Okay, last point. Because Esther went to the king, and he said, what, what do you want? And she said, I just want to meet with you tomorrow. And he said, okay. Then in that meeting, he said, what do you want? She said, I want to meet with you and Haman tomorrow. And he said, okay. And this was like she's, she's like, she has his favor. He's listening to her. That's where the life changes. Your life and my life change. I want to encourage you in that. Our lives change because we have somebody in our life that can talk to our heart and open up our hearts and speak to us. And it's not in the story this way, but I just want to, for, for dramatic and for emphasis, just say, Esther, who are you getting your orders from? And she said, my uncle. Well, who is he? He will not bow down to Haman. He is very angry about this. He is very engaged. He is very awake. He's at the city gates with sackcloth, and he's screaming and yelling about how wrong it is. I, 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 well, Esther, you're not screaming and yelling. No, I'm not screaming and yelling, but I'm in the game. It's in my heart. I'm talking to the king. I want to help him. I want, I want this thing to turn around. And so, Esther, you are like the beautiful woman who opens up the heart of the man who needs the help. And if that's not a beautiful picture of like life for us, I don't know what is. Because your heart cannot open up by power, you know, muscles and stuff and guns and muscles and arguing and yelling and shouting. It doesn't work in a family. It doesn't work in a church. It doesn't work in our friendship. We need another, we need a spiritual approach. And this woman, she's there. And it's a message to us. That this is how my depression leaves. This is how my relationships like endure. This is how evil is dealt with in my life. And, 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 um, and remember when Haman is kind of caught and the king looks at him and he goes, what's going on? And then one of the attendants said, well, the gallows that Haman built for Mordecai are all ready to go. And the king said, hang him on it, on, hang him on it. You're right? Wow. So how come the king changed? I don't know, but I can say, we can say, well, we know, but we can say that, that when Jesus comes into your life, there are changes that happen, and they are, they are beautiful. And when, you, when we just say, no, I, I can't, that can't, I, I, don't, I don't agree with that. I just can't accept that. That's wrong. I just can't do that. And the world is saying, what's going on? Why not? What's a, this is the way that the king said. And the king said, 
He said, what are we going to do? Because the order already went out. And the council was, make another order that the Jews could protect themselves. Make another order that the Jews can fight against their enemies. And the king said, yes, okay. So there, the bad order had gone out, and now comes this order where the Jews be given the authority to defend themselves and fight. And in a way, we can say that we know the world is bad. That order is already out there. That's already happened. But we have the privilege of being on the inside with Jesus Christ and for us to be here doing something that is against the evil, to, to have words, to have love, to vote. Uh, to have an opinion, to be in the public square and say, I don't know about you, but that's ridiculous. I don't accept that. I am, I am. And they go, oh, you are, uh, you are for, with Esther. You are with Mordecai and, and so on. And of course, we say that's correct. We are. That's it. Would you pray with me? Lord, we have learned that left to ourselves, we can really mess things up. But you have sent people into our lives from the Holy Spirit, the church. We heard about the church. We, you have sent your, your presence into our lives. So we would not be having our head in the sand or hiding from our responsibility. But we would be with you, engaged in life, helping teenagers find your joy and people find a home and find love and comfort find a place to play music, to play baseball, to go to school, a place to come home to, a place to fight evil, to say, no, I'm sorry that happened. I must have been sleeping. When that thing happened, I, I can't. I'm so, I'm not sleeping now. I'm, I'm awake. What can we do? What can we do? And Jesus will help us live a useful life, profitable life of service and love to people. 